Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Kate Flash, B, 0, 3. Recognized, Artemis, B, 0, 7. Initiate, Super Sweethearts. Welcome to the cave, everybody. And welcome also to the second installment of Super Sweethearts, the series where heroes hold hands and we all know smoochy moments are important. Here, I'll be talking about teen heroes in love and diving into the romantic arcs on the show and what we can learn as creators about portraying relationships in fiction. Before we begin, as a disclaimer, I do want to say that all forms of shipping are subjective. The relationships I love, you may hate, and the emotional moments that I think are strong and well executed may have come off as forced to you. It's all a matter of opinion. So, like all sorts of analysis or writing advice, Take everything I say with a grain of salt. There is no one right way to write a love story. I'm just going to dive into a few and (laughs) share with you some of the subtle details you might have missed if you weren't as focused on everyone loving each other as I was. By popular demand, based on a poll we posted over on Twitter, today we'll be talking about those two stubborn teenagers who just refused to admit they liked each other. Spitfire! Known simply as Wally and Artemis to the uninitiated, though. And as a quick spoiler warning before we dive in, I will say that I'll be talking about who ends up with who and how we get there. So be prepared for spoilers on that front. Happy New Year, Justice League. Now I should have done this a long time ago. No kidding. So, the first appearance of the Spitfire relationship was actually in Young Justice. Like Super Martian in our last episode, Spitfire is not a ship with a long-standing comics history, and they have yet to appear together in any other DC media as far as I know. If I'm wrong, feel free to politely let me know on Twitter, but I'm pretty sure that Wally and Artemis haven't ended up as love interests in any other comic or movie or anything. And as a little explanation about the name Spitfire, with some of the Young Justice ships, the fandom came up with clever and unique names instead of just the traditional smashing together of two characters' names to make a new one. For Wally and Artemis, their ship name ended up being Spitfire, after the episode Denial, where Kent Nelson told Wally to find your own little Spitfire, one that won't let you get away with nothing. So instead of referring to them as wall art or kid to miss or anything else that just didn't feel quite right, we called them Spitfire. So starting at the beginning with these two, from the moment Wally and Artemis met, they were clearly butting heads. Their introduction to each other could be described as rocky at best, and their dynamic quickly falls into what TV Tropes defines as belligerent sexual dungeon. It's a dynamic as old as Shakespeare, actually, and essentially refers to two people who fight and bicker either because they haven't realized they're crushing on each other yet, or because they're trying to hide it. This dynamic can be a lot of fun, but like a lot of popular tropes, it can get a bit problematic when taken too far. Bickering, banter, teasing, competitiveness, that's all well and good, but when this trope moves into physical belligerence, it can stop being cute and start being a real issue. So if you want to approach it, keep that in mind. In the case of Wally and Artemis, they stick to bickering and a handful of exasperated, playful shoulder wax from Artemis to Wally when he's being a bit too inappropriate. So I personally don't think there's anything all that wrong with the way this trope is presented on Young Justice. Part of the reason this dynamic works for Spitfire is because it manifests as both of them challenging the other to be better. Early on, Artemis constantly calls Wally out on his immature behavior and inappropriate comments about Miss Martian. She will not let him get away with that nonsense. Her influence is one of the many factors that makes him grow up and become a more mature individual as the first season unfolds. Meanwhile, Wally's constantly questioning her and challenging her. On some level, this keeps pushing her to prove her skills and show that she's just as capable of an archer as Roy, but it also forces her to reevaluate how she interacts with the team and with him. He fights her when she takes the dismissiveness too far, and that helps her realize that being confrontational all the time isn't always the best course of action. 
Wally and Artemis fall into belligerent sexual tension mainly because they're both passionate individuals who made a bad first impression on each other. They don't fight because they have radically different personalities, they fight because they're surprisingly similar underneath some superficial details. That's something important to keep in mind if you want to try your hand at this trope. Sometimes characters fight because they genuinely can't stand each other, but sometimes it's just another form of flirting for them. In the case of Wally and Artemis, they want to make out, but they can't admit they want to make out, so instead they insult each other repeatedly, hoping the other one will figure this whole thing out for them. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about how they eventually break out of this cycle a little later on. But first, let's talk about another prolific trope. Will they or won't they? The kind of unending tension and buildup that makes you root for two dorks who just keep dancing around each other. That type of slow burn relationship can be a lot of fun to both read and write. <laughs> However, this dynamic can get really frustrating when stretched out for too long. Keep that in mind when writing a romantic arc. We all want to see a relationship build, but if you make your audience wait too long for that kiss, they may just lose interest. Thankfully, Wally and Artemis only keep this trip going for one season before tying things up and starting a new chapter. But while it's going on, there are quite a few ups and downs and almosts. Unlike a lot of will-they-won't-they they dynamics that stay pretty static the entire time and then just fizzle out, Spitfire has quite a bit of development and evolution before their season one finale hookup. So let's talk about that evolution. When you have characters that start off firmly in one sort of dynamic, sometimes it can be hard to change that interplay between the characters without losing the core of who they are. As a result, sometimes you need intense moments to develop that relationship. Gradual evolution is great, and we'll talk about how Spitfire does that too a little later, I promise. But sometimes big things happen and drastically change how two people interact with each other. Wally and Artemis' relationship and dynamic changes over the course of the first season with three distinct major shifts marked by specific episodes. After several episodes of sass, sniping, and seeming like they might rather kill each other than kiss each other, Bereft confirms that the horrible introduction to each other and first impression they had caused most, if not all, of the animosity between these two. When they wake up without the past six months of their memory, a very important distinction from losing all of their memory, they're still essentially the same people in Bereft, they just haven't met yet. They're perfectly cordial with each other. <laughs> More than that even, they talk, they smile, they touch, they flirt. Wally calls her beautiful, Artemis seems a bit jealous when McGann shows up and knows who KF really is, and they even hold hands while getting their memories pieced back together. All of this shows that if they had met under different circumstances, without Wally embarrassing himself and being mad about her supposedly replacing Roy, and Artemis immediately going into attack mode, and that first interaction putting friction into all of their later conversations there is a pretty good chance they'd be dating by now. Or at least openly flirting. <laughs> they have the same personalities and core characteristics, but are placed into a different first meeting, and that results in a very different outcome. And that revelation can't and doesn't just go away the second they get their memories back. If you pay attention, Wally even makes a little attempt at flirting with her again, but his ninja boyfriend comment is shot down almost immediately. Sure, they go back to bickering and attempting to ignore everything that happened, while Robin tells them to just get a room already, but there are repercussions to the sudden discovery that, hey, maybe I kind of sort of possibly like you. Then, several episodes later, Failsafe shows us that even with all that bad blood between them, Wally still really cares about her and would be devastated if they lost her. When Artemis dies in the simulation, Wally has the most outwardly intense reaction. He's devastated, and he's ready to rip the world apart just to get her back. That's not the response you have when you supposedly couldn't care less about a girl. 
The fallout and disorder it even confirms this further, with Wally's therapy session simply being an acknowledgement of his complete denial of his feelings towards Artemis. While Artemis's deals briefly with her fear of telling the team, but specifically Wally, about her family history. From this point onward, they're both thinking a little harder about their feelings. And little moments in secrets, misplaced and cold-hearted, all show that these suppressed revelations are still definitely weighing on their minds. And then we get insecurity, which screws everything up. Wally and Artemis are on pretty good terms at this point, and this episode shows us that. From him being able to pick up on her annoyance about Roy joining the team, to him actively complimenting her and telling her she's a valued member of the team who has nothing to prove, especially to him. He compliments her throughout the episode, they have a casual, comfortable tone in their dialogue and physical contact, they're working really well together and looking out for each other. Wally even stands up to Roy, one of his longtime friends, just because he thinks Roy's being way too harsh on Artemis. However, all of that awesome development falls apart when Artemis' reckless decisions during the mission are revealed. Decisions made at least in part out of fear that the rest of the team would discover her secrets. But not knowing the full story behind Artemis' fear and insecurity makes Wally just think she acted selfishly and immaturely. And Artemis's refusal to explain herself only reinforces that view. He's been sticking up for her all day only to feel like she's betrayed his trust by making some really bad choices. Everything's been moving along so smoothly until it's abruptly forced back to even worse than square one. Now, Wally's actively mad at her while she has no real reason to reciprocate that annoyance anymore. If that last scene hadn't gone down the way it did, I could have easily seen Wally asking her out after that mission. But the way things fall apart there makes that kind of impossible. These types of dramatic scenarios are intense. They naturally change individual characters, how they feel, how they think, how they act. And as a result, those characters reevaluate their feelings for each other. Maybe not always consciously, but it's happening. And that helps to keep a storyline tight. If your characters are taking too long to admit their feelings, consider throwing an alien invasion at them. And the reverse also applies. If you throw an alien invasion at your characters, two of them might let you know that they've actually got feelings for each other that even you might not have known about. There's no time to dwell on a dragged out will they or won't they plotline when near-death experiences are forcing your characters to think about what, and especially who, really matters to them. We'll talk about how their season one dynamic gets resolved in a minute, but first I want to talk about some of the smaller moments between Wally and Artemis. If all you do is big shifts, you miss out on some really important development for the relationships between your characters. While Spitfire's story is definitely largely tied to big dramatic episodes, there are some smaller hints at their ever-evolving feelings as they leave the aggressive tension behind and move towards something a bit sweeter. From her genuine concern about him and his family in Misplaced, to some mid-mission bickering and jealousy in the tie-in comics, to a couple of shot composition choices that placed them in very close proximity to each other, which made quite a few fangirls squeal. There's a lot of stuff going on if you're paying attention and looking for it. But a great example of one episode full of little moments of development is Revelation. During that mission against the Injustice League, Artemis offers Wally a rebreather to help him not drown. Kid Flash is really concerned about Artemis getting attacked by Count Vertigo, and when he breaks his arm during the mission, she's the one who makes him a sling for it. But one of the weirdly most notable little moments is at the very beginning of the episode. Robin and Aqualad are commenting on the fact that Connor and McGann are dating now when Artemis and Wally walk in, and Robin asks Calder, do we tell them? A line that actually has a couple of different interpretations depending on which shipper you talk to about it. But why is such a small scene so notable? Because they walk in together. Okay, you're thinking that I'm overanalyzing things, but let me explain. This one little moment is a perfect showcase of what happens in a lot of ensemble television. As the audience 
we don't get to see everything because there's just not enough time. Season 1 had to balance a core team of six main heroes, plus a bunch of villains, mentors, other heroes, and additional team members who joined later. If Young Justice was just about KF or Artemis, then yeah, I'd expect to see more of their interactions outside of main missions and nearly dying. But the show's about everyone. So as a result, we don't get to see every single conversation Wally and Artemis have. This is made even more apparent by the timestamps on every episode and comic. Time passes, and we can't know exactly how they got to this point, but little moments like this, them entering alone together, show that they do talk and interact even when we don't get to see it happen. So I think it's safe to say that their relationship progressed pretty naturally, even when it wasn't the focus of an episode. As a writer, don't ever feel like your audience has to be privy to every single second of a relationship, especially when you're dealing with an ensemble cast. Readers and watchers can usually fill in the blanks if they're given a good framework. Sometimes as a writer, you have to trim off some of the cute little moments you might want to include between a couple, and allow the focus of your story to drift somewhere else to keep the plot moving. So take the time to work out the moments that are most important to how this relationship unfolds, as well as the smaller moments that complement the core of that love story, which still seamlessly fit into the larger narrative you're dealing with. So, after all of that ever-evolving Spitfire drama, both big and small in season one, Usual Suspects and Old Acquaintances wipes the slate clean. The revelation about her family and why she did what she did back in Insecurity returns Artemis and Wally to where they were around the beginning of that episode, just on the cusp of finally saying something about how they feel. And after a few tender moments, sidelong smiles, and a surprisingly successful near-death team-up, they finally do something about all those feelings. That New Year's Eve kiss, guys, it's so cute. I love it. I love it so much. And I have two side notes about it. One of them is if you somehow still haven't heard Jason Spizak's hilarious story about recording that scene, then you definitely need to go check out Rich's discussion session with him. And as a second side note, Spitfire's first kiss even includes Wally's ongoing signature move of bridal carrying Artemis. It's a small thing, but it's a little through line in their relationship that I think is really cute. Visual motifs in ongoing character interactions make me very happy as a shipper, and this is definitely one of them. It's a trend that starts in Bereft, but I believe also appears in the common slash uncommon denominators two-parter from the comics, and throughout the show it's kind of implied that it just sort of becomes something they do, and even continues into the very last episode of season two. And speaking of season two, that time skip happens and our heroes go from being bickering-in-denial teenagers to two college students clearly deeply in love and living together in California. I will say that these two are clearly in a committed relationship. Love interests generally don't move in with each other unless things are pretty serious. The time skip lets that happen and allows for five years of really positive development between the two of them. Any awkwardness that might have existed early on is worked out by this point, and they're happy. They're so, so happy. This is how you do a relationship upgrade from belligerent sexual tension right. I have no doubt that Wally and Artemis still banter with each other. They totally still tease each other and poke fun at dumb stuff the other one has done. Seriously, just go rewatch that little interaction in Summit. You will see the banter is absolutely still there. But the anger isn't. The biggest difference from season one to season two is that all the real animosity between these two is gone at this point. If you want to do belligerent sexual tension with your characters, great. It can be a ton of fun. But if two people have been together for five years and they're still arguing like a couple of repressed 16 year olds, and something's gone wrong somewhere along the lines, and you may need to reevaluate how you're writing them. Because two people who are still constantly fighting with each other and don't seem to even enjoy being in each other's company 
probably shouldn't be dating. Once your characters get past the insult each other to disguise your feelings stage, they'll eventually be able to talk about those feelings. That's why that drastic shift in Wally and Artemis' relationship from season 1 to season 2 works so well. They're in an actual relationship now, and being open about their feelings for each other allows them to have their happily ever after. At least for a little while. Because, of course, all of that is cut short by Wally's death at the end of season 2. In the long term, Wally and Artemis don't get a happy ending. They get a tragedy. But the fact that Wally had an incredibly happy life, that he chose a domestic and safe life with his family, with a college, with a pet dog, and especially with an amazing girlfriend who he clearly loved and who clearly loved him, makes this finale so much more devastating. You need those moments of joy and victory and love. Artemis waiting up for him on Valentine's Day, Holly's delight at finally being able to bail her out from being undercover, them kissing in Paris. You need all of that to increase the impact of his final moments. His last words being for Artemis would mean nothing if the writers didn't put the time and effort into building up that relationship. If you want an emotional impact like this to hit home, you need to put in the work first. And while Wally's death is packed with genuine emotion, and death should hold weight in fiction, and drama is incredibly important to plot, the romantic sap side of me really still wants a happy ending for these crazy kids. So... Fingers crossed for something in season three. There's always hope, right? I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And to wrap up this episode, as always, you can get in touch with us over on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website crashingthemode.com, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. While you can't really hashtag keep binging YJ now that the show's off of Netflix, consider buying it online while we all wait for that DC streaming site. And don't forget to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology. That's the best way to read that fun little museum heist storyline where Robin, Wally, and Artemis fight Cobra and Spitfire bickers the whole time. If you're interested in checking that out, I definitely recommend it. And don't forget to tune in soon for the next episode of The Young Justice Files. And remember, stay whelmed. You've been listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.